Welcome again to another session of uh, Revy User Groups. I see new faces. Um, welcome. I encourage you to keep coming. Uh, our group can only exist if there's a base of users like yourself uh, uh, coming on a recurring basis. So thank you for coming. Uh, our blog, sfdugblogspot.com, our email. Uh, send us uh, questions. You are also open to present anything to the group. Feel free to uh, reach out. Follow us on Twitter. We're very active there as well. Uh, so today we have a, a few announcements. If you're a new member, make sure you subscribe to our blog. Uh, there is a field in the blog that enables you to be uh, updated when the new uh, uh, meetings are coming up. Also, make sure you sign up before noon on the day of the event. You won't be able to get into the office, and the view downstairs is pretty adamant of not letting anyone come in unless it's sign up. So sometimes I can go down, sometimes I can't. It depends on what I'm doing and if I pay attention to my cell phone. So please sign up before uh, noon. August is a very special month, so we are one year old can believe time flies. So the <coughs> on the occasion of our anniversary, I think we're going to try to do uh, the next meeting a special edition. <coughs> uh, and uh, we're going to try to present you with an educational model of about half an hour with a survey of practical dynamo workflow for the everyday user, something that most of you can relate to. Uh, and the committee is going to uh, present, uh, you know, the top two workflows they use on an everyday basis. Uh, and hopefully that's something that you can take with you and, and learn from. Uh, and the second part of that next presentation is uh, social, sponsored by the Roku's and ID8. So it give us an opportunity to meet and greet a lot of you I know by face, but maybe I haven't, we haven't exchanged much uh, conversation. So. Uh, and it'll be also, you know, a, a good way to get feedback as part. What do you expect to see next year, and uh, what kind of topics you want us to present, uh, uh, ideas, etc. So, uh, as well, we are always open for speakers. Uh, email us, uh, send us sfdugcoordinator at gmail.com. Uh, we have an agenda packed till January next year, so we are looking for speakers in February, March, and forward. Uh, this month we have wine and refreshments sponsored by the Rokus. Thank you, Brock Howard. And uh, the food, as always, I ate it. Uh, we're very gracious uh, by providing us our food. Um, so we have a uh <coughs> A uh, great future speaker today, uh, Mustafa Sadegifor. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce it correct. Uh, he is the creator of Ladybug in his uh, faculty. Uh, creator of Ladybug and Honeybee, I believe. Uh, and he is going to talk about his own creation, uh, parametric uh, environmental plugin for Dynamo. Uh, I'm going to spend the first uh, five minutes just talking about the, the node of the month. And this is the dictionaries. And uh, what are the dictionaries and how can it help us uh, uh, process information? Uh, so Mustafa, welcome to the uh, San Francisco Dynamo user groups. There's about uh, 30 people in the room uh, looking at a screen. Uh, I'm going to make you a presenter after I talk for five minutes on this uh, dictionary node and uh, give you the uh, stage. Uh, and uh, thank you. Welcome and thank you very much for uh, being open to present uh, this great uh, add on. Um, thank you. All right. Uh, let's see. So, who here has used the dictionary node? Or there's one person. Um, in, in, in Dynamo, there's often this need of uh, map information based on uh, the, a list of key values. 
Um, I'll give you an example. If we are doing an occupancy calculation, uh, sometimes we want to map the occupancy load with the use of the space. So <coughs> making that map uh, correctly based on a key value is facilitated by a node called dictionary. And it is not something that comes out of the box, but it's something that we download as part of a package. Um, those who know Dynamo, you can download uh, uh, packages using the package manager. And I have a bunch of packages downloaded uh, on my uh, Dynamo 1.0. Uh, one of my favorite packages is this one, the Spring Nodes. And the Spring Nodes have one uh, node called Dictionary. Uh, Launchback also has a very similar, and it works pretty much the same way. Uh, so imagine yourself grabbing a dictionary. I mean, there are there's a term, and then there's a definition. So in in the, in the, in these in the node, pretty much work the same way. The keys is the term that I'm going to look for, and the value is the meaning. It's uh, w what is associated the IQ with. Uh, and the th search keys is the list of elements I want to find a meaning to. So say, for example, the keys is uh, it's an alphabet from A to Z. And associated to A to C, there is a different value. Right? Uh, on the search keys, I have a list of elements from uh, the model or from anything. And I, I want to associate the meaning of my letters with uh, what what with the, with the meaning, and that's what this really means. Um, the there there's a version from Lunchbox that pretty much works the same way. Uh, the Lunchbox version enabled me to create the dictionary first, and then utilize uh, the the dictionary to get the keys and values basically. But uh, the the Spring Notes version basic, uh, uh, condenses both uh, functionalities into a single one. Um, so let me give you a quick example of uh, how to use that. And here's a question for the um, Revit gurus. How do you apply a color override to clouds based on the revision number. So somebody asked me this question a couple of days ago, and I'm like, how do you do that? My first reaction, oh, it's filters, right? When I go to the filter dialog box, revision is not a category that's available for that. Um, then my second uh, thought is, well, maybe, um, uh, uh, I can select via schedules and then uh, uh, make selection via schedule filters and then apply graphic overrides, but that sounds very complicated. Um, so I couldn't find any other solution other than using Dynamo. Right. So on the screen you have four clouds. Each of the clouds belong to a different revision number. And the task is how can I assign a different color for a different revision sequence. Um, other than you know, picking it manually, right click and override and view. Uh, so I created this very quick de definition and it utilizes um, a dictionary. So what this does, it uh, pick all the elements of the revision cloud category and extract a parameter, the revision number. Uh, these give me a list of um, revision numbers. And these are revision two, three, one, and four. I can sort them if I need to. I choose not to do that here. Uh, I suppose I could have used also the revision description, to, and, and then I will have four different descriptions. But basically, the unique items give me the keys that I want to associate a meaning to. Um, so, um, 
the dictionary by key value is going to provide me with that map information. So what, I'm, what I created here is a set of four different colors and I converted it to a single list. And then looking at the node, I say dictionary, these are the terms and these are the <coughs> meanings. So for my key zero, with the values two, associate the, this first color, which is red. For the second element, which is uh, three, associated with this element, and so forth. So these are the keys, these are the terms, and these are the meanings, these are the values. And uh, with these, the first two inputs, I build the dictionary. Now I need to input what is that I'm searching for. And what I'm searching for is the, the, all the parameters values coming from the model, which has the search keys. So the search key create that map. Create the map between the color and the term I'm looking for. And then it, the last step is to create a element override. So I ran this already. And you see in the background that you know, I have it automatically populated. Um, and this is better than picking one cloud and then right click overriding view or make four selection sets based on a parameter value and then uh, override the view. <coughs> um, so that's my quick uh, demonstration of the dictionary. Um, does that make sense how it's used? And in this case, I, I mean, I mapped color with a list. But in case of, a, for example, an occupancy calculation, I could map occupancy use with a factor. And then uh, all you need to input in your rooms is the occupancy use. And then uh, create a list of the different factors, and then you can map it that way. Uh, or if we're doing plumbing calculations, you can do it that way as well, uh, uh, et cetera. So Again, it's a great, uh, it's based on a Python uh, definition. It's super useful. Um, uh, feel free to jump in and start using it. Um, any questions? It's part of the Springs Node package. There's, a, like I mentioned, there's also a launch by variation. So the launch by variation, I have to build the dictionary first, which is basically it is too easy. And then I use that dictionary in order to search keys. So it's, it's, it's two nodes instead of one. Uh, questions? OK, uh, that is my two cents on the node of the month. Um, and uh, let me come back to uh, my WebEx. And, uh, um. Is it shared now? It's beautiful. Can you see my screen? Yes. OK, perfect. Uh, thank you so much again uh, for inviting me. Uh, so I will be presenting today uh, Ladybug uh, for Dynamo, uh, which actually changed a little bit because at the time that we were talking about this, uh, I didn't know if Honeybee can make it to the presentation. but. Fortunately, there is a work in progress version of Honeybee, which made it to the presentation. So I'm going to do Ladybug and Honeybee for Dynamo. Uh, I should give a warning. <laughs> Some of the materials may not be suitable for a Dynamo user group. I have a slide with Grasshopper content. Uh, just just let you know. And, and mainly because uh, we, we have a, a long history in Grasshopper side and that's kind of like how everything is started. And that features are coming to Dynamo slowly. There are changes in the process that I will talk about, but I will be using some, some Grasshopper slides. Uh, this is what I will go through. Uh, we'll have a short introduction uh, about Ladybug and Honeybee, what they are, what is the philosophy behind the development, which I think is important to know like uh, how these things are next to each other, what they're trying to do, and then why we have a Ladybug and Honeybee for Dynamo and where this development is heading now, which is both in Dynamo and Grasshopper now. And uh, I will do a demo of Ladybug and Honeybee and uh, the API. I, I can't see you guys, but if you can help me, how many of you there are no Python or coding Python? Can you tell me? 
There are there are three, four raised hands. Okay, not that many. So maybe we shouldn't put that much time there. And how many of you are, are the Ladybug Honeybee users in Grasshopper? Five people. Okay, not that many. Okay, then, then that makes sense. For that five people, I'm sorry, a little bit uh, in the start may be boring for you, but then when it goes to the dynamo side, it should be uh, new. Okay, let's get started. Uh, and actually, I have one more surprise. That we, we like, it's not only ladybug and honeybee, there is a, another insect, a butterfly, which uh, was kind of like there, and then like uh, other stuff happened, but finally we have a beta version. We are looking for testers to test. Uh, I'm writing the guideline tonight after this presentation and from tomorrow you can test it, but now it's uh, available for Grasshopper and what it does, it connects uh, a Grasshopper and later Dynamo to open foam for CFD simulation for airflow analysis. So this is how it is. There is a plugin called Ladybug, which is mainly for weather data analysis. And there is a Honeybee, which is for energy, daylight, and comfort analysis. Uh, this is how Ladybug used to look like. It was a uh, plugin for Rhino Grasshopper, which uh, it takes the EPW file, which is the energy plus weather file, and generates graph uh, in, in Grasshopper Rhino environment for visualizing weather data, analyzing weather data, some analyzing on the geometry like radiation analysis. And we have re renewables now as a part of the package that you can estimate PVs, uh, solar hot water, and all that stuff. This is what Honeybee is uh, in, again, uh, Grasshopper uh, originally. So what it does, it connects uh, the parametric environment to validate the simulation engines, uh, day seam and radiance for daylighting simulation. Um, let me use actually this new feature that they have. Uh, day seam and radiance for uh, daylighting simulation, open studio and energy plus for energy uh, simulation, and also some some scripts inside it for comfort modeling and then uh, most recently they have therm and window uh, to, to use for, for uh, modeling the R value and, and all the stuff that therm can do mainly. Uh, these are a couple of graphs of what you can do with Ladybug. Uh, uh, that I mean it's, it's a range of uh, comfort. You can see sun path. Uh, ray tracing and, and all that stuff and, and this is what you can do with Honeybee. Again, these are this is this is previews of, of, the, of what we had in Grasshopper and we, we still have for lighting modeling, glare analysis, energy modeling, and putting putting the results back to uh, on, on top of the geometry. Uh, what I think makes makes the the plugin different in a way is. We are not trying only to provide uh, the connection to, to, for running simulation. In, in no way this is a single click run simulation thing, but what we are trying to do is support you to understand not only the process to run the analysis, but to visualize the results and, and to see, make what's happening inside the simulation engine, which is usually invisible, visible. So what you see here is reading the results of an annual analysis, annual daily analysis back, and now you can see in every point of time how the daylight is changing inside the space and if the blind is down or not. So, and these, these black ones are where your sensors are. Uh, the, way, the way we put it usually is uh, Ladybug and Honeybee and now Butterfly are toolkit versus the tool. So instead of having a um, hammer, which is great for nail, you have a bunch of toolkits that you have to put together for your for whatever you need to do. Uh, this is an example of putting stuff together to draw a sun path and run some comfort analysis. And we have some components, like in that, uh, if, if you want to think about it in that way, that's like a Swiss army, Swiss knife, like I don't know what they call it. Uh, that, that has so many inputs, so many outputs, you can do way too many things for them, but you know, like, uh, when you have all this stuff, uh, you can do so much, but uh, there, 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 there is a delay to, to, get, to get really used to this. So this is how people like to see the process. Uh, so you have Ladybug that supports climate analysis and massing studies, 
then during the process you start doing running some daylight thing and energy analysis where honeybee is useful and then you do airflow modeling at the end but uh, if anyone ever has done any design process this looks more like this so you you have something maybe you do a weather analysis before the first meeting and then it goes all the way around uh, and, and at any point, in each point, you may need like any kind of analysis. And this is how we think, and we think Ladybug, Honeybee, and Butterfly are designed to support such a disk process. However, they can support this process if it exists ever. Uh, as a result of that, you end up with uh, 113 components for Ladybug and 222 components uh, for Honeybee which basically if you want to go through math and I, I will use logos uh, for uh, uh, for like as a, as a source to, to just for this concept to describe it. So let's say we have two logo bracks, Lego bracks. Do you know how many different combinations you can make with two? Any, any takers there? I can't see you so you have to shout. I can help you with that if nobody is going to talk. So that's 24. Do you know how many it is with three logos? Should I say it myself? <laughs> <laughs> okay, 1016. What about six? A little bit of math. Well, probably you can't guess. This is this big number that you can make with six Lego bricks. And there are like two different numbers. There is a research actually. There, if you watch the Netflix one, that number is lower than this. But then there was a PhD guy in a university who reran all these things, and this is the number. So if, if you can do with six Legos, this is the different combinations that you make, then how many different combinations you can make with 335 components for Ladybug and Honeybee? I know what some of you are thinking about, and, and actually it's, it's more crazy than that because it's not only Ladybug and Honeybee, there is Ladybug and Honeybee in this uh, environment of all the other plugins. Now this one is for Grasshopper and the same for Dynamo. So it's not a 300 something, it's like thousands of different plugins and, uh, sorry, no uh, components or nodes, what you call it in Dynamo. That, that can be around each other to make a different combination. And this is, this is usually what happens with Logos 2. 10% of the time is playing, 20% is losing the pieces, and 70% is swimming, which kind of like in, in a Ladybug Honeybee thing, I say like usually 10%, 20% of the time you're really using it, 70% of the time is screaming which component, where was that, how to put it together. But there was a reason for that. and, and um, I don't know if I play this. Can you guys hear this or not? Can you hear this? No. no. Okay. So this is this guy is this is a TED talk. You can go watch. This guy talks about this a story of uh, which 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 they call IKEA facts. So there used to be uh, this thing that there used to be a way of making cake. There used to be a cake that you could take, buy, put it in, a, uh, in an oven, bring it out, and that was the cake. But, but the problem with that, what they found was, because it was way too easy, nobody could, you, you couldn't put it in front of people and say, this is my cake, because everybody else should say, could say, oh, actually, this is, this, is, this is the same. I can do this cake. What's, what's special about this cake? And, and the solution to that, what they did was, if I can see if there's an image, they took out the eggs and the flour, so now you had to do a little bit more to, to make that cake. And as a result of that, everyone could have their own kind of cake, which was different from the other person's cake. And, and this is kind of like what they say about, and I, I really recommend everyone to, to watch this, this TED Talk, uh, this link. It, it, it calls uh, what makes us feel good about our work. And it talks about like because of that that effect, now people feel kind of like they had a part of that process, and because of that, uh, the cell just went up. And and this is the same thing that I think about the process of uh, 
uh, using ladybug and honeybees, and that's when people say they're making me smarter. So it's not all about making it easy, but it's about making it make people make people ca- capable, educate people, and make them smarter. And uh, don't worry about that. It doesn't mean like it's really really hard, but uh, Definitely what I want to make clear, it's not a single click button thing. It, it's something that you need to put together what, what you want to do. And again, it's, it's an open source development. It's uh, community-based. And, and the reason for that, I really believe in, this is a part from the book Too Big to Know that says when an expert ne- network is functioning as its best, the smartest person in the room is the room itself. And these are some of the examples that are making uh, Ladybug community, at least on, and now we're having Grasshopper, uh, very interesting. Uh, we, we, it's, it's more than just a software tool. People really come in and, and make a discussion, talk about the formulas that they think should should be used, like what is the concept, and they go through it. And kind of like it's not like we are kind of a number of people for just develop. It's a community that really helps us with each step to make decisions and go forward and what they need. Uh, these numbers are old. Uh, I think now we have more people and more downloads, uh, definitely. But like they were a couple of months old, but this is now how you can see what was the trend. 2013, we started. 2014 and 2015 were, was when, and these things are the, the, this graph here is the discussions on the group at every day. The good result of the community that I'm talking about is 95% of the questions that you send in less than three days will get an answer, and 78.5 of them in less than a day. If you're unlucky to be that 5%, then uh, that's a different story. And uh, on the side of that, we have uh, a website called Hydra, which is uh, uh, the, the address is this, hydrashare.github.io that came out of a hackathon, which not only we have the development distributed, the, the sharing of the uh, example files are also distributed, so anyone and everyone can, uh, with, with a workflow that Hydra has, uh, share their examples with other people, and it's uh, visual, so you don't need to download the file and open it to understand what's happening there. You can just see it online. Unfortunately, can't test it yet, but if, if you make sure that's the real file, that's the right file that you need, you can download it and then use it. These are a couple of examples of what, what you can do with Honeybee, with, with Ladybug uh, and then Honeybee. This is a, a paper that's written to, to figure out what is the optimum shape of the building based on the solar gain, um, again, uh, using Ladybug and Grasshopper, and then uh, the optimization engine. This is a more advanced one that is trying to uh, make an optimization framework for early stages of design. So they're trying to figure out what are the forms that you can use in the early stages of design to meet the ASHRAE baseline and even work better. This is, again, a paper that you can read, but I hope it gives you an idea about like how these workflows are capable for iterative run so you can uh, generate and test uh, multiple uh, options in a short amount of time and do stuff that uh, before, before having this kind of workflow was really, really hard, if not impossible to do. And again, a reminder that this is how we think the workflow is. Uh, again, one other good news about, about the development is as a result of uh, like uh, different users, there start to be like other open source projects. This people in different offices start to have their own uh, flavors of the uh, of the plugin, which means they pick the ones that they think are the most useful. They put it together. Uh, this is this is a uh, one that uh, Foster office in London put together, and they even name it. And this is again not good uh, uh, resolution, but they call it Honeybug Ladybee which I think is a smart, uh, which is a mix of both of them. And it's uh, cool on the surface when you look at it. They have their own customized uh, components that does what they need. But when you double click on the component, this is what happens inside, which, which is way too much overhead. And the reason is you have to copy paste these components around for what you need. And it wasn't clean at all. Uh, on the other hand, well, what happened at the same time was the, uh, this call for like, okay, can we do the same things in Dynamo and, uh, and Revit without copying this stuff over? This is a post by Paul uh, Winter. Probably some of you know him. He's like 
his handle is Permetric Monkey, and he's pretty active on the Dynamo side of Liz. And uh, th there were posters like this due to limitations of Dynamo. This tutorial will illustrate how to extract Revit rooms for analysis in Grasshopper and Ladybug before pushing the results back. So it was kind of like, okay, you take all these things, only take it to Grasshopper because you want to, to run some sunlight average analysis, bring you back all, all the way to Revit to, to make the schedules. Thinking about all this stuff together was where this concept came that let the bug fly free. And by that, I mean uh, taking all the libraries of Ladybug and separating the geometry libraries from the core libraries, which is just Python. And in this way, now we can have the same code running in Grasshopper and Dynamo. And then under the hood, they will call Honeybee and Ladybug, which are pure Python. They have no geometry uh, dependencies. And these two are talking with Radiance Energy Plus and, and all the other uh, simulation engines. I know it, it might be pretty abstract, but I will try to show in examples. And I'm trying to be fast. Uh, if I'm very fast, tell me not to be, because I want to put more time on the live coding and showing like uh, really how, how it happens in, uh, in Dynamo. So we moved all the development now on, on a new repository. If anybody there is a person who codes or, or wants to see the code, it's under Ladybug Analysis Tools. Uh, the old one is on, under my personal account, but the new one is uh, under this new group. So uh, you can check uh, all the different ones that we have. So you can see there's a web version going on. There is Honeybee X, which is for Grasshopper in Dynamo. There's a Honeybee Core that I just talked about. And uh, now we have an API, which uh, and an API documentation, which means um, not only you can use the nodes in Dynamo, but you can create your own nodes by writing a couple of lines, uh, which I hope I can show one of them today, tonight to you um, at the end of the presentation. And uh, one of the other things that it brings is now you can write a number of lines uh, in Python, and what it does, what this code does, for example, it takes uh, idea file, it takes an idea file, and it creates a radiance model out of it. Uh, and, and in this case, you don't need any uh, visual interface or any geometry library because both of these files have have, have their own uh, geometry language inside the file. So you can use uh, Honeybee to import the idea file, and then Honeybee to create a Honeybee zone, and then write a radiance file. Uh, I don't know how many of you are like performance gurus in, in the firm, but if you are, this should be really <coughs> exciting and help, helpful. And the same code can be used inside Dynamo to do stuff like this, like creating a sum path. And uh, the sum path is because it's, it's coming into Dynamo, you can permissively change the values and it's, and it's updated. And you can use uh, the sum vectors from sum path to run analysis like sunlight average, uh, which is which is the one that you can see here, and and I will show to you. And most recently, uh, you can even run daylight analysis, uh, which is the honeybee forest in in Dynamo. This is very under still like under heavy development. The the core components are there, and I will show you how to set up a daylight analysis and run it. But uh, still, there are a lot of components that should be added. Like if, if in uh, Grasshopper there are like, I don't know, was it 200, 300 components here is like 20 right now. But, but the code that you need to create the, the nodes or components, so I use this term, but they both means the same, I think. Node in Dynamo is what component is in Grasshopper. So they're both the same. And uh, because it's again inside Dynamo, so you can you have this chance to automate the process and run a number of analysis one after each other uh, if you need. And this is this is how the code looks like. In uh, here is Dynamo, here is uh, Grasshopper, and this is what I was trying to say. So except for this part, which is importing the libraries. Uh, and, and because how Dynamo Python node, you can change the, the name of the input uh, 
the, there is a different way of reading the inputs, but the rest of the code is the same, which basically means if you write something in, in Dynamo or if you are writing something in Grasshopper and it's easier for you to write that, you can copy paste it between the two environment and it will work fine. So any questions before I start the live demo? Does it mean no? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> okay. So I start opening Revit. So just while this is opening, how many people there have used Ladybug uh, for, or anyone has used Ladybug for, um, for Dynamo? There's only one person. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah, like I hope you were not disappointed, especially if you're coming from the grasshopper side. Uh, okay, so you guys, I'm pretty sure 100% like everybody in that room knows Revit better than I. So I'm not going to talk about Revit at all. Uh, but uh, I will try to keep it inside of Dynamo. I will start with, um, with Ladybug, but I won't stop on Ladybug as much as far as uh, like from the feedback that I had for the last few days. I think people are more interested in Honeybee since usually the project when it gets to Revit is uh, past the weather data analysis and all that stuff. But, but still, I will show a little bit of the, of the Ladybug side. Okay, so uh, if you download the package, uh, Ladybug will be here. It has five different uh, branches or folders, uh, whatever they call it here. One is Ladybug, Ladybug, which is for the basic stuff like importing the weather data. The second one is for analyzing weather data. The third one is for visualizing it. And the fourth one is for running some environmental analysis. Uh, what is happening, and I'm saying that for people who already used uh, Ladybug, if, if there's any, anyone online on the call, is because uh, Dynamo turned out to be very slow in running geometry calculations. Uh, all this analysis is uh, moving now to Honeybee, uh, which uh, is what I'm going to use today too to run some sunlight average analysis. Okay, so let's just start with uh, Ladybug stuff. I will import uh, weather data for San Francisco. Then uh, I will uh, use the location data that comes from weather data to draw a sun path. And then we will use that vectors of the sun pass to run a sunlight average analysis. And once we go in sunlight average analysis, it, it will be honeybee, right? And then from there, I will move to, to running some daylight analysis for the same room that I'm going to run some sunlight average analysis. And finally, I show you like how you can use the API to address some of the limitations that are currently here because I didn't develop all the nodes for, for Honeybee yet. And finally, because uh, again, like on Twitter, people ask for it, uh, I will show you how you can take all this geometry and data uh, from inside Revit and Dynamo and use it in Grasshopper. Basically export this stuff here and use it in Grasshopper. And I, again, use that chance to write some code in Python to show how you can use Python code. Uh, okay. So let's get, get started here. Uh, I, for, for importing an EPW file, there is a component or node called import EPW. I just click here. Uh, what I need, and, and this is something that is a standard in, in all the Ladybug Honeybee components. All the inputs has an underline uh, before and after. Some, some of them only before, some of them only after, some of them on, on the both sides. And they have a meaning, so I just zoom in. So when you see an input that has an underline on the left side and there is nothing on the right side, it means you need an input. And here it means there is no input. 
So it means this is a required input to run this. No. When you see an underline here, it means you need an input, but fortunately there is already an input here. So you can leave this empty to the default. And if you go here, it shows like the default value is null, but the default value is, is an annual analysis area. So for EPW file, I need a file path to a valid EPW file. So I can use the uh, file path node from Dynamo, uh, browse, and then I can go see energy plus weather data, and then I will use San Francisco. So this is the weather file. I turn off the run automatic. I don't have great experience. So now I connect this here, and once I set the run to true, what the component does is it imports all the data from the weather file. I will just show the dry bulb uh, temperature in this example, uh, but, but you can get all the other data that you have. And still, I'm waiting for Dynamo to have a mesh that you can color, so we can have a 3D chart and visualize this uh, values in 3D, but, but it's still not there, so you can just get the values in. You can't really do that much with it. You, you can run logics to see like how many hours do you have that the temperature is between this range and that range. But I found usually people do the data stuff inside Grasshopper, which is quite faster with the same code. Um, okay, it's running, and it will import the 8,000 average data inside uh, inside Dynamo for all the average. So as I said, now you get all all the data, but what do you do with this right now? Not that much really. You can you can as I said, you can run some logics to find like. What are the number of hours, for example, that the temperature is between a range and relative humidity is between a range, so you can have uh, natural ventilation, something like that. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to use this location data that comes out, the component, which is San Francisco, to draw a sun path. Sun path is under visualized weather data. Here's the sun path. Again, what I said. So some path, you need the north, you need the location, hour of year, center point, scale, sun scale, and all that stuff. But again, I just look on the right side, and the only thing that I really need is the location. The rest has some default values. I know that some of you are thinking about, like, Revit has a single location. Why we have an input for the location? Yes, Revit has a single location, and you can import the location from Revit which means you can use this um, location. I think this is the one, right? No. Mm. Returns, yes. And you can use this, this one, to whatever it is. But as I said, like how Ladybug is designed is about options. And, and there is an educational value in being able to change the location at least and see how does it affect all the things that you're doing. I think it's a very limiting to have a single location for a single building. I know in, in Revit environment that totally makes sense because the building is not going to move around. But sometimes you want to run a study and understand, okay, well, how this building is going to perform in San Francisco versus, uh, I don't know, New York versus, what was the location of this file? Sydney, Australia. So this is kind of like this is why you have this these values. However, you can just use the default regular value if you want. So I will use the location of uh, of the weather file, which is San Francisco, and then if I run it, you will see it will run and it will draw a sun path. So here is the sun path. I have only a single sum position, which is for the average 12 of, of the year, right? So let's generate all the sum positions instead of this. Generate all the sum positions for today in, uh, in San Francisco, if that sounds good. So to do, to do that, I need to, I either can use analysis period, which generates uh, 
a number of, based on month, day, hour, it generates the analysis period and dates and hours of the years. Or I can use calculate hour of year, which takes month, day, hour, and minute and generates hours of the day. They're both the same. So what I will be doing is I'm going to use this. And uh, the month is 7, 13. And for the average, I will do all the average uh, for today to 23. So I connect month to month, day to day, and hour to hour. And if everything goes right, we will have all the average of the year for this for today in San Francisco. And this bit is partially because of Dynamo, partially because of my laptop. This probably runs much faster on your laptop. Okay, so it calculated this. You can see here that these are all the different days that I, that I asked for for every single hour. So if I connect a watch component note, all right, watch note here, this will run, and you see these are the, the hours of the year that we are looking for. So I just connect the average of the year here for the average of the year. I can run this. And now you will see that, here we go, we are pretty in summer, right? Very close to the longest day of the year, and these are the, the average that you will have sun in the sky uh, in, uh, in San Francisco today. And, and we can, even if this is like way too much information, you can turn off the annual sun path and make it, uh, sorry, and make it a daily sun path. So I can just do false here, connect it again, and run it. Okay, and now you see it just, creates the daily sun pass for what they have. The good thing is because this uh, is in Dynamo, then it outputs all these outputs that can be useful uh, later on for doing different stuff. For example, you can start uh, drawing the lines between the sun positions and the center. So if I do line with a sore point and end point, the star point is wherever the sun is. The end point is the center point. So these are the lines. And also, it gives me the sun vectors, which are quite useful to be used to design shading or to run sunlight average analysis. So I just run this and then, yeah, so this is, these are the vectors, and we should see the lines. So now kind of like this is a graphic that, hmm, we go in 3D view. I was hoping you can see it in in Revit, but I don't know for some reason you can't right now. Okay, anyways, but but you can you can move it to Revit if you want. So is there any questions so far? And I take it as a no, so I just move forward. So now, what we can do is to use this vector to calculate sunlight average, number of sunlight average in San Francisco for, for this certain day. What is sunlight average? It is the number of average that each test point receives the direct sun. In, in many uh, urban design codes, you need to, uh, to run this analysis to make sure that uh, there is a certain number of hours that uh, that 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 the space sees sees the sun during a special day. Usually, it's it's not uh, today. It's, it's usually uh, first of uh, January, 
that, that, that they take, but it's different from country to country. So what I'm going to do is to, to use these sum vectors and run a sum like average analysis, and I save this file just in case. Uh, Okay, so to do so, the first thing that we need is the geometry. So in, in here, I have two rooms. Uh, there is a curtain wall on the other side here. There are a couple of windows. There's a walkway in the middle. So what I really need is these two rooms. I want to create a grid inside the rooms, and then I want to run the analysis for that. <coughs> To do so, the first step uh, is to take the geometries in, and for that you can use Honeybee. There is a node in Honeybee under Honeybee Revit down here that uh, collects all the rooms. Uh, I believe there are similar nodes that collect rooms. It, it's okay, or you can use the uh, native uh, Dynamo nodes to, to collect the rooms. And then there is one, um, another node that takes that room and creates honeybee zones out of that. Uh, let me run it, actually. That's, that should be easier than saying what, what really they do. So this one is going to collect the rooms, uh, and then it actually works for both rooms and spaces, because they are the same. But here, I have two rooms. I just use the rooms. There is an option here to set the boundary location if you want want it to be in the center, if you want the room to be in the center line of the element, or if you want it to be on the finish. By default, it's in the center. I just leave it there. And then um, maybe I run it step by step. So I run the first one. And now I got two rooms that I have, so this is right. And I connect it here. I save. And I run the second one. So what this node does, it takes the, the room that you have, it reads the data inside the room, it, oh, and here we have a, a scale discrepancy. Okay, so that's why the sum pass wasn't showing up, because the units of the document is in millimeters. So now you see that the, the script took the, these two geometry, and uh, converted them to honeybee zone. And this is a representation, so you make sure everything uh, is fine uh, from, uh, from your geometry. So now I can go here and first, before doing anything else, fix my sum pass. So uh, actually, is it, is it right? I think it's right. So I can scale the sum pass. to fit the scale. Maybe that was too much, uh, but still better. Now it should show up in, in Revit, yes. So that was the thing, it was there, but the scale wasn't uh, really working. Uh, I'm not really happy with this. I just do it 500, so it runs next time that we run. Uh, so now we got the room. Uh, we have all, all the all the geometry, and it has already all the data. All I need to do is to set up and, and run a sunlight average analysis. To run a sunlight average analysis, uh, I can go under here, and this is how Honeybee works, if, if, especially if you have tested it on, on Ladybug, you already know. It, there are recipes for different type of analysis. So there is a recipe for sunlight average. <clears throat> and if I insert the recipe, it tells me what it wants. So it wants sum vectors because it needs it, that's what it calculates, how many sum vectors that you see. So I can take the sum vectors from sum path. And again, like if you go, there is a, there is a description for each input. So it says use ladybug sum path component to calculate sum vectors. Or you can use dynamo vectors. It's not like it only should come from sum path. If there is any vector, it should work. Then you need test points and point normals which are the test points that you want to measure the sunlight average, and then you need the point normal, which basically says what is the direction of that test point. 
So for these rooms, I can go and find the floor uh, and then use something to make the grid and then move the points. Again, to do that easy for, for users, there is generate test point components and there is generate test points from Honeybee zones, which will only work in Revit. I mean, if you if you use if you create the the rooms, uh, the honeybee zones from rooms. So what it needs uh, is the grid size and the distance from the surface. So let's do it for every 50 centimeters, which is 500 millimeters. And I think I lost half of the people there because I'm not using feet and inch. Uh, you can use feet and inch if you want, uh, but uh, but it it basically works with the uh, units of your uh, Revit Revit document, whatever it is. And then for the distance, uh, I do 750 from the floor. So this is the grid side. This is distance from base. And I will run this first separately so you see what will happen. The sum path should be scaled, and the test points should be generated. Save the file before running it, and then run. And it gets quite interesting and colorful right after this. So if while it's running, anybody has any questions so far? I have a question, Mustafa. Does it make a difference if you use the another method to collect the rooms, or does it have to use uh, uh, your package, your nodes? No, no, it doesn't make a difference. As far as you have rooms, it will work. The only reason I put this together because I wanted to have access to rooms and spaces at the same time. So I don't know if there is any package to collect the spaces. But no, it doesn't really matter. Everything should work fine. I have one more question. Um, mm -hmm. Are the rooms already defined in Revit as uh, room boundaries, or are your package detecting them? Well, right now, they are all uh, like created by the user. But but it's it's easy enough to write one to auto detect rooms, but I think that can make a mess, potentially. But if that's something that's a useful workflow uh, from Dynamo, then I can I can I can start to write one. So this is what happened. Some passes are scaled, and now you can see there is a there is a grid uh, based on the grid size, uh, half a meter, and then they're moved up. So and this is every test point that we will calculate the sun, sunlight average for them. So we expect this thing, this window is not to get that many from here to get more. And let's see how it works. So, okay, I generated my points here that I have. I can connect it here to test points. And I can connect it to point normals. And I have UVs here as outputs because if you want to put these results back in Revit, then these UVs are going to be uh, quite useful. Uh, there is a discussion on the on the GitHub, and there is a discussion in Dynamo from how to do that. Uh, you can use uh, um, Arc Laboratory. Is, is it the name of the? And I should have it. I did, I don't have it for Dynamo One, but I have it for which is uh, developed by Conrad. So you can use that to take this results and and bake it in, in, into Revit. So ha you have it uh, after after you close the file. So now, here it will give me a sunlight average recipe. And again, because I like to run everything step by step to make sure it's not going to crash, I just run it again here, and it should generate a sunlight average recipe. You can see here it says there is a sunlight average recipe. There are two point groups because there are two rooms, and number of points is 391. And if there is an error, it will give me an error here. Now it says all good with, which means everything is good. The error report. And now that I have the recipe, I can run the recipe. So uh, under daylight analysis, there is a run radiance simulation. So all this analysis, like what Ladybug Honeybee uses under the hood is radiance, as I showed in the presentation. Again, if we check here, the inputs that you need is analysis recipe. Here I want to run sunlight average analysis, so I connect it. Honeybee objects. Honeybee objects can be honeybee zones and honeybee surfaces. In this example, I use room, room to zone to make it easy. So 
you, it generates, sorry here, it generates honeybee zones. But you can actually create the model surface by surface if you want uh, using the honeybee surface. For example, if you want to add some shadings in front of here, you can take that shading, create the honeybee surface, assign any material that you want. Now I have all the default material, and then add it to the, to the scene here, add it to, to the package. So for, for this one, for honeybee objects, I will be using honeybee zones, which is the only object that I have. So I have the recipe, I have the object. It asks for a working directory and a project name. So working directory is where it, it writes the files, and the project name is the project name that you want this analysis to have. It's quite useful to name them and, and uh, know where, where you're writing them, especially because Honeybee has this feature that you can go back and read the results from folder. So it's good to know where your results is. Write and run is always separate in, in all the uh, packages that we have. And the reason is you can write it without running it. So you can check the output when you write the file. Maybe you don't want to run it right away. But if you set both of them to true, it will write the file and it will run it. So let me just follow the good practice that I said. So I just put this in C backslash ladybug backslash uh, demo. And then I will call this uh, run as demo, demo2. And then yes, write and run it. Uh, okay, this is, I forgot to put this as a string. I mean, for all of this, you can use Dynamo nodes uh, to, to load a folder or something. I just, I just think this is faster. That's why I'm doing this. And then I write and run. So when I write and run this, if everything goes fine, I should have some results. It comes out, and in the next step, we just map the results on, on top of this grid to, to visualize it. So I just run this. What will happen is a radiance window will show up. You didn't see it because it was on, my, on the other screen and it just went away. So the result is actually ready. Now Dynamo is thinking. So now you can see here, I get the result values for number of average, which should be between zero and whatever is the number of sun positions that we have. For some reason, it zooms all the way out. Now I have all the values. What I need is to generate a bunch of colors and assign the colors on, on top of this grid. To do so, you can again use this result and use the normal Dynamo process of creating, generating colors based on values, and then uh, color these geometries. But to make it easy, uh, in, in Ladybug, there is a component under extra, which, which called generate colors. If you are already a Ladybug user, this is like recolor mesh in, in, um, in Ladybug for Grasshopper. So what it does, it takes the values and it takes some parameters that I will, I will introduce when I, when I run the daylighting analysis, and it generates colors based on that. So if I run this, it gives me colors for each result that I have. And then I can use this uh, to color using the display, and I think display, mm, by geometry color. So the colors can go here. And for the geometries, I can use these profiles that I generate here. I don't create a surface inside the, the node, and the only reason is because I think it's slow to, to do uh, any like geometrical calculation uh, inside unless you really need it. So what we need to do here is uh, we, we need to create a surface. From each polygon, I use by patch. I set the preview of this one to off, so we see a better result out there. And I set the preview off here too, and I connect this 
here. So now if I run this, what should happen is it should calculate uh, the colors, and based on the colors, it should color inside my zone or rooms. Uh, so I just run this. I didn't save. And usually when you don't save, at that moment, Okay, it's working fine. And still, again, Dynamo is thinking for preview, and here we go. Here is the results. So I just saved this based on the colors. Unfortunately, still we don't have a legend that you, that you can read here, and I tried a couple of times to put, uh, to use this, uh, uh, what is here, uh, announce a label to put the values here, and it either crashes Dynamo or it doesn't work, so I'm not going to try. But and let me actually use the legend parameters here. So this is kind of like what you see, but I mean, this is the default colors. Everything is default. We can read the numbers and make sense that what is what is this colors. But usually in, in, in when, when you run a environmental analysis, you want to tell a story. For example, here, we want to find the area that uh, takes let's say, more than three hours of sunlight. So we want to see wh which areas in my room takes more than three hours of sunlight. So for that, we can use this thing called legend parameters. Le legend parameters give you the option to customize uh, the legend in, uh, in Ladybug and Honeybee. So it's, it's under extra in Ladybug. One of the things that I can do with legend parameters is I can define a domain. Domain by, by default is between minimum and maximum. But what I want to do now is I said I want to find the areas that has more than two hours of sunlight. So what I, I need to do is to say, okay, for, for the start, take the minimum. For the high bound, take two. So whatever is more than two, and I forgot here is not high bound. Uh, uh, so whatever goes more than two will be a, a different color, will be red in this case, and whatever is less than two will be blue. So I just connect this to the domain here, and then I connect it to the legend parameters. And as you can see, I can customize the color, but right now I don't do that. I just run the analysis again. And now, if everything works fine, which this, and for some reason we have three colors. So it's minimum, minimum, between minimum and two, and more than two hours. But I have, I have to check. But now you can see how, how really this thing works. Uh, the other thing, for example, you can do, you can say, okay, what is, uh, let's do minimum two, and then between two and five hours. And to do that, you need to change the, the type because the, the first type is continuous now. We need a segmented coloring, which makes more sense when, when we get to daylighting. So I just put one here for the segmented coloring. So this goes to that, and this goes to this. And let's actually change the colors too so you can see. So there is a ladybug a color range which generates uh, colors based on uh, different types. Uh, like we, we have kind of like a default color set. So I will use the, let's say, thermal comfort percentage number seven. So here I use seven and I use these colors and these colors should recolor everything. And again, I forgot to say, but it worked. So now you can see it's a little bit of weird colors, but all this uh, magenta color is basically between zero and two. The red ones are between two and five, and then these gray ones are, are five or more num uh, for the numbers. Okay, now this is sunlight average. How I can run a daylighting analysis with this? If, if no one has any questions going forward. I have a question. Oh, mm -hmm. um, 
In this example, you pulled the rooms, and that was the only thing that the room geometry that you pulled from Revit, and you can use the surfaces and others um, from Honeybee to kind of generate context and materiality. Yeah. Are the rooms the only things you can pull from Revit, or can you start to pull things like context? Context, you mean normal geometry like other buildings? You, I mean, I don't have a script to do that, but you can, you can pull it using the uh, normal Dynamo uh, nodes that, that lets you select element by type, for example. And then after that, what you can do is uh, to use Honeybee Surface. So what Honeybee Surface does, it takes a geometry, a Revit geometry, like whatever you have, you explode it, you, you put the surfaces here. And for the radiance materials, you can create a material for context, or if you leave it alone, it's just auto-assign the materials based on the normal direction. And then you can create a list here. Mm. List create. And then basically connect this here, connect this here, and connect both of them here as honeybee objects. Right. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Just, I mean, I wish I was fast enough to create something in Revit and show you, but I'm not. So, uh, I'm not going to do that. Okay. So this was uh, this was a sunlight average. Uh, uh, it's good. It's part of like the analysis that that you can do. But what's really interesting and, and people want to know more is daylight analysis. They want to know like how much daylight I get inside inside this this place, uh, in in these two rooms. Uh, to do so, like as, as you should know already, there is a recipe for that too, and and the recipe to run that right now is uh, generate grid-based analysis, grid-based analysis for daylighting. So I I click and this thing comes here, and you see this is a recipe for uh, similar to the sunlight average uh, recipe. And what is interesting is from the whole workflow that we have here, the only thing that we need to change is the recipe. The rest is the same because the same geometry, the same uh, node is going to run it, and the same workflow to visualize the results. So I just moved this thing a little bit further. I disconnect my legend parameters because this is, this is set for sunlight average analysis. So let's see what we need to run the daylight analysis. We need test points and point normals. Uh, we already have these two. The same test point, the same point normals. Uh, it asks for a type of the analysis. Do you want to run illuminance, uh, which is locked? Do you want to run radiation, or do you want to run luminance? The default is for illuminance, which is what you usually want to run for a grid-based analysis. And then it has an input for radiance parameters. So radiance, when it runs, it has some parameters for ray tracing. I mean, this, that's uh, something that I don't think I'm going to cover in this uh, video, but there are discussions uh, on the Grasshopper group. Uh, there are discussions online that you can you can search. So basically, it lets you set up the parameters based on your analysis, whatever you have. The default parameters are set to run a fast analysis more than an accurate analysis, so you can get a sense. But if you want to change that, then you have to use Radiance Parameters node here that lets you set these parameters. Again, I'm not going to show it here, and as you can see, it says it has default values, but it's needed. So this one has a default value. Last thing that I need is a sky. There are different skies in Radiance, uh, and there are different skies that you can use for daylight modeling. Right now, in Honeybee, there are two of them. Uh, one is the simplest sky, which you can put a certain illuminance. This is useful if you want to run a daylight factor analysis, for example. And there is another one, which is the CIE standard sky that lets you generate a sky based on the location data for a point of time. Uh, so I will use this uh, to generate the sky. It's a little bit more inputs, but uh, I think it will make more sense uh, to you when you see the result, because the other sky is symmetrical and, and the light will come from all, all the sides, so there is no sense of direction. So the inputs are north because you can rotate the sky or without rotating your geometry if you want to running some orientation studies to see like, okay, how does the daylight is going to change if I run, uh, if I change the orientation of my building without rotating the geometry. 
there is a location input because to generate the sky, we need to know where the location is. Uh, we need longitude, latitude, uh, time zone, and you need the time, which is month, day, average, and then you need the sky type. Do you want a sunny sky with sun? Do you want sunny without sun, intermediate, and all that stuff? There are other skies. There are climate-based skies that you can generate the sky for each average from the EPW file, uh, but they are not yet here. They will be added very soon, but uh, what I'm trying to, to do is basically show you the potential and the workflow more than really going to, to all the details. So I need to connect this guy here. The input that I need is month, day, and hour. Um, let's use today uh, because I have it here. So for month, I just connect the same month for hour. Uh, oh, sorry. That's uh, th that's the day. So for day, I just connect the day. For hour, let's go for, I don't know, 2 p.m. Uh, but the sun is very high. I don't know how the daylight like, turns out because of the angle, but let's actually try. So I just do 2 p.m. 14, and I leave the sky type as it is. For the location, I need the location of San Francisco, which is the same here. So I just take the location that I had here. And maybe this is a good time to say, if you want to take the location, you don't really have to do to use this component to take all the weather data in. I just showed this because I want to show you like you can do this. There is a node that just imports the, the location. So you can just use this. It's probably faster uh, if, if you use that. Okay. So here I have a sky set. I, I have a recipe here. All I need to do is to change my recipe. And a question here, when I'm running this grid-based analysis, is it going to overwrite my uh, sunlight average analysis that I just ran? So I just copy the folder so you can see how this is a structured in the folder. Well, the answer is no, because uh, when you create a folder, it goes, and for each analysis, it creates a subfolder. For example, here was sunlight average analysis. So it, it creates a sunlight average folder, and it runs it under that. When you run a grid-based analysis, it will create a folder for grid-based analysis, and, and the results will be there. OK, let's go ahead and run this. This probably takes a little bit longer to run, so I can show you the radiance uh, window that pops up and I see on the other screen that is not shared with you. Uh, so it's doing its dynamo thing of calculation. Uh, okay, the window is here, so it started to run the analysis. As you can see, this is running an R trace if you're a ratings user. So, and these are the parameters that I was talking about that is in. The analysis is over again. Uh, waiting for Dynamo. And here is the results. So, okay, do you think this room is well daily or not at this hour? Based on this image. Anybody is nodding or something? I can't see anyone, so you have to tell me. Big no. <laughs> it's not well daily. Okay, never say that before checking the scale. So we don't know what this color represents. So what I'm going to do is to set up the maximum uh, of my node to 500. So we know 500 is a, a pretty good and uh, enough daylight, and I remove the color set because it wasn't really pretty, but or maybe use another one. Uh, yeah, like the color set that Equitech used to use that people really like. So I just connect these legend parameters. So now the maximum is 500, which means wherever it gets more than 500 blocks will be colored whatever the color of this Equitech thing is. Here we go. So 
it is actually well daily. So whatever goes here, the same color, this is more than 500. So that's, that was something like, I, I have seen that always happens. You run the first analysis, you have a hot spot next to the window that basically changes all the scale and you see that and you're like, oh, there is not enough daylight, why? But there is enough. So this is, this is one of the, and that's why this legend parameter is really important to make sure what are you doing is, uh, is what, what, and what are you visualizing makes sense. Uh, I just zoom in a little bit because I want to work on this a little bit more. So the next thing I, I need to do is, again, like I go back to what I showed, which is, okay, this is all these colors. What I really want to know, I want to know which area is between 300 and 500, and which area is between 500 and 2,000, and which area is more than 2,000. So I want it to be segmented. If you're running something for lead, for example, this is the way that usually you want to to look to the result. So I run it again, and now you will see the same analysis. So it, it doesn't run the analysis again. It doesn't do anything. It just uses the results. You can see these areas are more than 2,000 potential glare. These areas are between 2,000 and 500, right? Between 300 and 500 and less than 300. Probably we will have issues here in the corners of the room to, uh, uh, to, to do like normal office activities. But okay, let's do this. Let's uh, say, okay, I actually need this corner. I put like so many people to work here. So I want to add a window here and see how does it uh, change the design. So all I need to do is, and now you will see my Revit knowledge. I'll be embarrassed. Okay, uh, let's see where is where is this window that I want to add? So it's in the room that I have um, this curtain wall here in the corner. I'm changing the view. So here, uh, what I do, I just control C, control V. Things a little bit, a little bit more, and now I have a window there. So I can go back. So still thinking, yeah. And I think like th these things are, I, I take responsibility for that. This is my laptop. It's, it's not really something that I should use for with Revit. Uh, it's probably it's going to be faster on your model, uh, on your machine. So now I, I will get rid of all the extra calculation that I don't need. Uh, like I don't need to draw the sun path. Uh, so I just disconnect this. I just disconnect this. So this thing is not going to run again. Um, I don't need sunlight average. Just disconnect so it doesn't work. And actually I can freeze them, uh, which I'm still not used to it, but I think it's pretty cool uh, here in Dynamo. So I need the location. Based on the location, it generates the sky and it runs everything. But uh, one thing I need uh, to to do is to reload the the Revit geometry. To do so, I just set this thing to false, or I just disconnect this. And I run it again. So now it should remove everything from the scene. And I connect it back. I connect it back and run it. And now what should happen is room should be updated. The analysis should be running again. And now we will see the new result. And we will see if we got to a 300 thing that we needed on the, on the site. Any question while this is running? Stuff I'm going to check online to see if there's any mm -hmm. posted on, on the chat. Sure, please do. And then probably after we're done with this, I just close uh, my Revit and open it again. So because it gets really slow when I run a couple of things. Hey Mustafa. Um, yes. Are, are there plans for this, for Dynamo or Grasshopper? 
are you uh, to ever interface with ISVE? ISVE, uh, yeah. not not uh, not from outside because it's not open source, and we unless there is real interest and like because I put like our team puts all the time that we have on open source software that that we know is is available to everyone, and we can check the source code and see what's going on. But uh, there has never been, uh, like, nobody ever talked to me. But I think they have a plugin for Revit, don't they? Oh, they do. Oh, okay. But uh, uh, anyway, so the analysis is, is already done. And you can see now this guy is, is joined, the more than 300 uh, area that we needed. So uh, we kind of, uh, now you can see, like, and you can see it's pretty fast. You just, I just changed something in the model the analysis, and now I can see the result like in, in, a, in less than a minute on my laptop. So it should be way faster on yours. Uh, so from, from here, I want to go on and show some, some of the stuff that you can do with the API. Is there any question or anything that you want me to show uh, in particular? Up to here, and and I think like one of the things I think like which is kind of obvious is again, and and I want to uh, restate what I mentioned. It it you can see the process is pretty straightforward. You get a room to zones, you you create a recipe, you connect them to a component that runs it, then you visualize it. It's pretty straightforward, but it's not uh, a single component say run and it collects all your Revit model that we have no idea what is what, runs everything, gives you 20 pages of report. So that's, ask me what it's designed for because I, I personally believe that's a garbage in garbage on, a garbage out process. But this, this thing, if, if you know how to put it together, it gives you the opportunity to have something to do that. But, but you need to first put it together so make sure this is really modeling uh, what you really need to model. Okay, next step is I ran this thing, but uh, well, we actually never assigned the, the material for the glass, right? I just did it and it just ran. And there are a couple of uh, areas here that I wonder if I use a pretty dark glass, how that thing is going to change uh, the lighting inside the room. So in the grasshopper side, you have a component here that lets you change the materials for, uh, for, for the zone. But so far, like, uh, we didn't have time to do it. But if you want to do it, it's actually pretty easy to do it now because you can do the API that I mentioned. So I try just to do it live, and, and I hope I, it doesn't fail. I don't think it's going to fail, but it's just about how fast I can do it. So what I want to do, I want to take all this, uh, all the glass materials, which by default are 60% uh, transmitted, and make, make it a dark glass, like 25%. How can I do that? So what I need to do, I need to get all the glazing surfaces from my honeybee zone and then assign a dark material to them. For material, dark glass. Uh, so for, to do so, like the material part, the material is already available here. So just take this note here. So it lets me to create a material for, for, uh, for glass in, in radiance. Uh, it needs a name, and it needs a transcendence. So for the name, I'll call it uh, dark, uh, glass. And uh, for the transmittance, I do 0 0.25, which is pretty dark. Uh, oh, my bad. Actually, I want to be a string for the name. So this will create the, the material for me. This is the glass material. OK, now I want to apply, and I remove this. I delete this from here uh, to make it cleaner. And now I, I want to change all the materials inside this uh, honeybee zone for all the, all the glazing. So to do so, uh, you can start uh, using the and I can show it here. So if you go on GitHub uh, and not Honeybee, 
Honeybee app. There is a API documentation that you can check, and here that all the uh, modules and classes and everything that we have. So under Honeybee X, we have one for Honeybee Zones. So if I go here, I can see that uh, Honeybee Zone has ceilings, floors, geometry, has geometry rules, has is Honeybee object. So somewhere should be something for me to get all the surfaces. So okay, here is surfaces, and it says it gives me the list of all the Honeybee surfaces for this zone, and then. I can go and see what I get from the Honeybee surface. So Honeybee surface has different methods. And I know there are only, you said, four people who really use Python. So I don't want to just like to, to, to go all the detail. But what you, you can find here, for example, you can get the radiance material. You can get or set the radiance material. And it shows me how to do that. So I can say, oh, radiance material is this material that I can create. And I say honeybee surface dot radiance material is this material. And again, I can see here that there is a has child surface that I can check if the surface has a child surface. And there is a, ch a property for children surfaces that return all the children surfaces. So having all this information, I can write a couple of lines uh, in Python that actually uh, should uh, let me uh, change all the materials for, for, for all the glazing. Any questions so far? Should I just go forward and do it? Yeah, go. OK. <laughs> it sounds like I, I can't see your faces. Or is it like everybody is bored? Or is it just getting exciting or what? <laughs> Everybody's okay, really I excited. <laughs> OK. I believe you. <laughs> OK. So. Let's see. Mm. Uh, so all I need is a Python node. So I just type Python. And I hope it was faster in searching like, for a single node. Uh, so I, I need two inputs. One input is my honeybee sounds, right? And the second one is the material that I'm going to create. So all I need to write, and uh, maybe I just do it, and probably I write it wrong the first time, but I'll show you how, how to fix that. So the first thing is honeybee uh, zones are uh, in one, and a dark glass is the other input that I have. And so this is just in. Uh, so I get the honeybee zones and dark glasses from my input. So now I have to say for zone in honeybee zones, uh, for surface, which is a honeybee surface in zone that surfaces. So, and uh, what else? So I want to update the material only if the surface has, uh, if surface, and I don't remember, was it has child surfaces or has children surfaces? So let's go has child surfaces. I think that's then if it has child surfaces for each child surface um, in a uh, surface that uh, children surfaces. Uh, what, what we want to do, we want uh, this, this, this child surface. Uh, we want the radiance material of this child surface to be the dark glass that I just assigned. So, okay, uh, I do this, I run this, and then uh, we, oh, actually, let's, I, I forgot to output. So now my zone should be updated. I output the zone. Uh, no output the honeybee zones. So what I'm doing here, I iterate for all the zones that I have here. I have two. I iterate through all the surfaces. I check if the surface has child surface. For example, this surface here doesn't have child surface, so you won't check for that. So if it has child surface, for every child surface here, change the material in dark glass. And you can see that you can have other stuff, because a child surface has a normal. So you can say, if the child surface is facing this direction based on a normal check, do this. Otherwise, don't do that. Any kind of logic. But this is a simple logic that should work. OK, let's run it and see 
if it works in the first run, usually it doesn't. Okay, apparently it worked. So, what should happen? I get two new honeybee zones that has updated uh, material, and here actually I write uh, another code to show you how you can check if the materials are updated. Uh, again, I, I bring uh, a new Python node, and here I do it more Pythonic. So it's just so I just say out is. Uh, again, it goes the same, but I, this time I want to go backward, right? So I will. I want to check child surface that uh, radiance material uh, for zone in uh, in zero, and then uh, for surface in zone that surfaces. And then for uh, child, was it child? Uh, and no, this one is okay. But child surface in uh, surface. I mean, if you do the same thing in Grasshopper or any normal IDE, it will have auto conflict, so you don't have to remember everything. Uh, I think it was children's surfaces. Uh, in case that uh, the surface. A surface has a child uh, surfaces. Okay, let's see if it's going to work. And I found Dynamo not to like generators sometimes. So I just make it too well out of this. So here, what I'm doing, I, I'm collecting all the radiance material for any uh, child surface uh, in my zone. Okay, let's let's run this. Should run pretty fast. Here we go. So you see, all the materials is dark glass, dark glass, dark glass, dark glass, dark glass. So okay, so it means this thing worked uh, successfully. Now what I can do is I can just connect these uh, new zones, uh, which is the output of this component after changing uh, nodes. Sorry, after changing the materials, I connect this guy here. These are my new honeybee zones. And now I run the analysis, and you keep an eye here on the hot spots that we have. Save, run the analysis. Uh, it's actually running here, you can see it here. So I have five more minutes, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Yes. OK. So now that's ran. Yes, you see the effect. This room is starting to get much darker, but it's not still enough for this area. So you either have to make darker glass, or you remove the window, or add a shading. Uh, so this was. Uh, does it make sense? Anybody has any questions? Is it? Straightforward, and and just to let you know, if somebody like some people are just, oh my God, I don't want to write Python. This like these kind of processes that I showed are going to be nodes that you can just take from here. I'm just showing the potential of how you can customize the stuff and create your own things pretty fast. It's not like you really have to do this. So if there is no question, uh, the last thing I want to show is how you can take this data and move it to Grasshopper. And again, to do that, just uh, I I use uh, the API thing. I actually have the radiance file already there, but uh, I want to just again show another example. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to write uh, honeybee zones to uh, to my local drive as a radiance file, and then I'm going to load the radiance file uh, inside uh, inside Grasshopper Rhino. Um, I just remove everything because I feel it just slows down the process. Lead, lead. So all I need right now is to take this honeybee zones and I just delete all this too. Okay, clean. So all I want to know, I want to take this honeybee zones and write the radiance file out of them. 
I just saved this. Um, I run this so you can see everything is just start everything from scratch. And you shouldn't really take this long for not doing anything. I do, and actually, it's good to know. Like, is it is it only me that Dynamo is this slow, or is it like everyone? Because, because like for example, right now, all I did, I deleted everything, I disconnected the node. Basically, I'm asking to do nothing, and it will take uh, a minute so far. You know, Mustafa, I think part of it is is WebEx, which is a big uh, RAM hub. It uh, really slowed down. Uh, uh, the computer when you're presenter. Oh, okay. Hopefully that's the thing. But yeah, okay. So all happened was basically I did nothing. Uh, just I disconnected that. So now uh, I'm going to do my final script, which is writing all these zones to a radiance file, and then I will load the radiance file uh, live in in Grasshopper, which is probably is going to be fun. Uh, I think I already did create the Rhino file because it was because of just the time. Uh, so let me open uh, Rhino and type crossover. <coughs> so if you want. <coughs> To use the current workflow, and while uh, we are developing for the Honeybee for Dynamo, use the Grasshopper side to to get your model there and run the analysis. This is kind of a workflow that you can use. Um, okay, I think I wrote the file, but then I deleted the file. Uh, but it's okay. So uh, all you need is a Honeybee node. Yes, you're right. WebEx is really slowing down. Everything. Um, ladybug. And then here there is an import rat. Import rat. I need a radiance file. So this is the file. I need the file to be synced. So for, for the file, I will pick. Um, uh, so let's let's write all these files to see back as such a ladybug back as slash ds test that rad and then I read the same file from there. Okay, so to write the file, all I need to do again I need a Python node and actually now I do Python from a script because I think it's easier to read when I when I type in a code block. So I just connect Honeybee zones here. And then I write my Python code here, so you can see it. Um, so what I really need is to, uh, because I have two zones, I just I just collect them. I mean, this is not the best practice, but it's okay for now, I think. So what I can do, I can say uh, for for zone in in zero, which is my honeybee zones. Um, what I really need to collect is actually let's do it the right way. Sorry, change my mind. So for zone in in zero, what I really need is zone. So there is a method that uh, takes the zone and writes it as a radiance string, like as simple as this. So this will take all that zone and and create a rat uh, string. So this this will be two rather string. So now I can write this to a, to a file, which is uh, c backslash ladybug backslash what should we call this test uh, to grasshopper that's rat and this is the thing. And then here I I want to write to the file. As, as, as. So all I need to do is uh, out of write uh, basically whatever I have in the join uh, in the rat that I collected up there, and. 
And uh, this should work, I think. This should be it. So now if I do this, um, what should happen is I should get inside C back as ladybug, test the grasshopper wrap. Uh, let me run this and see if it happens. Mm, again, thinking while that thing is thinking, I just go and open C back as slash ladybug here. So you can see that here is the file, and it just generated 1046, which is time here, and it shows like I'm one minute over my time. But what I'll do is I take this, I just make this half a screen, and uh, Revit also half a screen. So here, if I go and say set one file path, and then pass this, Okay, this is not going to work. <laughs> Sorry. I have to copy it here. If I pass it here, and then if I preview on, this will make sense. Oh, now you can see my Revit rooms are here with all the details that they had, and the good news is they are actually separated based on the material. So if I want to do any, like, you see these are the materials that they have, and because there is no much, everything is generic, so let's just uh, visualize the glasses. I do wireframe, uh, I connect this here so we can see the surfaces, uh, and uh, the glass is branch three. Uh, this is like a nested list thing that you have in uh, in uh, Dynamo. So, so I just ask for the tree branch, and this is the tree branch. It gives me the tree branch. So I take the surfaces, and I ask for the branch tree. So I connect this here, and you see this is all my windows. And again, I can go, like you can see, two is all my walls here. One should be floor, and zero should be roof. So it's, it kind of shows like uh, Honeybee detected all the uh, all the geometries correctly and, and all the types correctly, and it moved them there. And uh, let's just for fun delete this. And this is the last thing I do. And then I I take questions and delete this guy too. Hello. So it's deleting. Uh, so I deleted these two windows here, right, from my Revit model. Mm -hmm. So if I go here, and I'm trying to fit everything in the same view, uh, and uh, disconnect this, run it once. And then connect, uh, and connect this and run it again. Once this thing is done, we should see, yes, these two windows are gone. Uh, okay, so this was the end of my, my presentation. Basically, uh, any questions, comments? And I have one more slide uh, that I want to show while uh, waiting for questions. and. Uh, that the fact that uh, the development of Ladybug and Honeybee wasn't possible without the help of this, all this great people all around the world who help us with different parts of this development. Uh, I hope many of them get to the Dynamo side. Uh, already Chris has started, sorry it helped uh, too, very much. Like uh, lots of the code for the Honeybee core is written by Sarit. And there are other people that I always forget to add and when I think about it, it's usually late, uh, but w there are more people, uh, more than these people who helped us for the development, and, and I want to thank them because it wasn't possible to have all these plugins uh, without, without the help of them. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Mustafa, what's, what's next on your pipeline? Uh, this is a, a, an amazing set of tools, and we really appreciate that First, you're making them available uh, as uh, open source. 
uh, and second, it's uh, it's uh, it it proves that you know a lot of these tools can be developed by the community le level from the input of a lot of people. So, what's next uh, on, on your pipeline? Well, uh, there are two on on the Dynamo side. Uh, really, the first thing that uh, we want to do, I want to do, is to get uh, the a solid uh, honeybee first for the light analysis and then for the for the energy analysis that's the first thing that that should happen because i don't want to jump you know forward um, before getting them working really nicely inside and being integrated to revit uh, and i think there is a still uh, so much to do there i personally think uh, ladybug in dynamo as far as i'm getting feedback is not going to be uh, like as useful as Honeybee, because usually, I mean, we always like to talk about this, that you can do everything in, in one software or not, but uh, like based on the feedback that I get, normally people in that like are going to use uh, the Grasshopper one, but there is a great use for, for the Honeybee side uh, for, for the energy modeling, for the energy and daylight thing, uh, basically for Honeybee. But what's coming next is this one, so as I said, uh, we are uh, now doing the butterfly, which is for CFD simulation, and connects, uh, again, uh, this environment. And now, because it's written recently, it's very easy to write the geometry libraries for Dynamo. To, so it will work both for Dynamo and Grasshopper and is for running uh, CFD simulations. But again, I think, uh, First will be Honeybee to, to make sure the Honeybee works and is stable, and then it will be um, the open phone connection for CFT simulation. But again, if we do all this stuff and we don't have a good mesh that we can color inside Dynamo, it's kind of like, why are you doing all this stuff in, inside Grasshopper, you know, inside Dynamo? Because the, the power is when you can run the analysis, you can take the results back, you can visualize the result, you can make decisions, make a change and, and again have the analysis run and see it. This is one thing. The other thing that I literally talked uh, today about it is we are trying to make Honeybee and Butterfly uh, for based open form radiance and Energy Plus cloud enabled. I'm using the term cloud enabled, which means if you want, you can run the analysis on cloud. And, and takes the results back. Uh, we understand that there are uh, many offices that are running uh, so many parametric runs that they have way too many runs that local machines are not fast enough for that. So we are working on that, and I think that will be available pretty soon. Uh, so you can you can run the analysis on the cloud. And I don't see the I don't know how much interest is there, but based on the emails that I get and the discussions that we have, there is a good amount of interest to be able to run this analysis on the cloud. Where would you be releasing that information? Uh, to, to follow? Okay, we have, uh, the, the Ladybug has a Twitter account, uh, which is, uh, I can actually load it now. It's Ladybug tool that you can follow. Uh, Ladybug uh, underline tool. This is the place that uh, you will see all, almost all the updates that we have. If you are not a Twitter person, you like Facebook, uh, we have a page on Facebook, uh, which is Ladybug Analysis Tools. The difference is here you get an S. Uh, here is Ladybug Underline Tool. This one is Ladybug Analysis Tools. And they are quite the same. Uh, Twitter is usually ahead of the, of the Facebook uh, in, in, in having the, the updates. Uh, and from these two, and then if you're a Grasshopper user, we post everything on a Grasshopper group. But in Dynamo still, I don't know, like there is no group to be part of, you know, like there is no, there is a Dynamo discussion that everybody can be part of, but there is no group for like Ladybug under Dynamo. So if there is one, I think that will be the place. But for now, it's Twitter and, and the Facebook pages. Is there any plan on releasing uh, other than a Python IPA? Uh, sorry, API? <laughs> <laughs> what happened? <laughs> Can you say it again? Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just wondering if you're planning on releasing um, the API in other languages. 
Uh, n not really. We, I mean, you can wrap it if somebody wants to do that, but right now all the development that we have is in Python, which you can use both in uh, Grasshopper and Dynamo in from Iron Python, but 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 we don't have any any plans to do uh, like a C sharp wrap or something like that. But if someone, I I never you never know. Maybe somebody else does and then share it with us. But from the core developers, I can tell you that there is no plan for that. And can I ask why are you asking? Are you asking for JavaScript or um, yeah, C sharp? C sharp and JavaScript. Maybe. Okay, for JavaScript, I have uh, the reason I asked. One of the uh, things that's going on, and CEO is actually he's in San Francisco, and he is the one who who is really running it. He he has started this uh, effort of uh, creating a ladybug web, which is which is where we are trying to bring some of the functionalities of ladybug and honeybee to the web. So there will be a JavaScript API, but it won't be this. I, I mean, there, we are still. I should I should have not said that. We are still like exploring what is the best way of of doing that. But uh, there will be a web version at some point. But um, it, it doesn't mean that the web version is going to be the same as uh, what you have in the, in the Python. You know, it's not a wrapper. It's basically writing it in JavaScript. So. For example, he finished the uh, the sun path one, and now you can see where where am I because it updates this thing based on my location, and the sun is down here, right? But then you can start like changing the month, changing the day, changing the hour, and then you can do shadow studies, and then you can load model. So we are doing some web-based stuff, and we think uh, eventually there will be a web version, but. Again, you can see like how it goes. It's a work in progress, and uh, mainly now is uh, developed by one single person, who is really powerful, by the way. <laughs> but but it's not. We we are not there yet, in a way. If it does make sense. Any other questions? Right, there's, there's no more questions. Uh, okay. uh, well, on, on behalf of uh, the committee and uh, the group, we really commend uh, the work you're doing. Uh, and uh, I think you have a very well-deserved applause from everyone here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your willingness of uh, sharing your work. And uh, if you're ever in San Francisco, uh, feel free to tag us along. We like to follow your steps and see where you've been, uh, what's the latest development on these amazing tools. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, this okay. recording is going to be made available on YouTube uh, probably by Monday. So uh, you can go back and review in our YouTube channel uh, the steps. Uh, and uh, I'll try to make it high definition so that we can uh, read it. All right. Thank you, guys, and, and thank, thank you, Mustafa. You.